Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Zechariah. The Old Testament book of Zechariah and Zechariah in chapter number 4. Now if you're looking for Zechariah, remember it's one of the last books of the Old Testament. So if you find the gospel record of Matthew and turn the other direction, you come to Malachi and then the book of Zechariah. Now, as we've been going through the series of the period of the restoration, what has occurred so far is that after the Babylonian captivity, where the children of Israel were were brought from their homeland and transferred to Babylon and throughout the Babylonian Empire for 70 years, that God restored them and allowed them to go back to their homeland with the idea that they were to rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And so they come back after the decree of Cyrus the Great. They begin to rebuild the temple by starting with the foundation and the people celebrated as the foundation was set. They met a goal and they were preparing for more. But after that, adversaries started to come and started to try to prevent the work. They sent lawyers and counselors. On top of that, you had apathy of people that just got tired of the work and they didn't want to go forward. And so what happened because of all of those things that the temple was not worked on for 15 years. So imagine in your mind that up on the temple mount on the highest hill of Jerusalem, there is a big slab for a foundation. The foundation is laid, but it has been neglected for 15 years. Imagine grass growing around it. Think about how the thing has been neglected. No one swept it off in 15 years. Nobody's touched it, but they've been concentrating on building their own houses and making their own selves comfortable. Well, after 15 years, God said, all right, that's enough. And so what he does is he sends two preachers by the name of Haggai and Zechariah to preach to the people and by the foolishness of preaching to cause the people to go back and Rise up and build. Haggai was the older preacher and he's more direct. He says, God says, build it. And so read through the book of Haggai and just see the direct manner that he he preaches to the people, just encouraging them. Now is the time to build. Now is the time to build. Now is the time to build. Whereas the younger preacher, Zechariah, God uses him in a different way. He gives him glimpses of the future. He gives him visions of different things for the purpose of encouraging the people, especially the leadership of Zerubbabel, who is the governor, and Joshua, who is the high priest, by encouraging them and the rest of the people that this is what God would give them to do. Through these um, visions, they are to get a glimpse of how important the people are to God and how God still plans to keep his promises to the Jewish people through the visions and through the prophecies to show how important Jerusalem will be. That in fact, Jerusalem is going to be the capital of the millennium kingdom. It's going to be the capital of the world one day. And so you need to rise up and build because God has plans for this city and for this temple. And so as we're continuing through the book of Zechariah, understanding that the people are trying to be motivated, trying to be encouraged through preaching to go ahead and rise up and be obedient to what God has given him to do, we come to Zechariah chapter 4, and we see another vision of Zechariah. Notice with me in Zechariah chapter 4, and notice with me, if you don't mind, in verse number 1. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 1. The word of God says this, And the angel that talked with me came again, and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep, and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked and behold a candlestick all of gold and a bowl upon on the top of it with and it seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps which were upon the top thereof and two olive trees by it one upon the right side of the bowl and one upon the right, left side of the bowl so I answered and spake unto the angel that talked with me saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, 
But by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain. And he that bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel hath laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also Finish it, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice, and shall see the pummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Then answered I, and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick, and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again, And said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark a phrase that we find in the book of Zechariah chapter number four? The book of Zechariah chapter four and verse six, notice the phrase that God says, by my spirit, but by my spirit. And with the Lord's help, we're going to preach this idea as this is the picture, the vision that Zechariah has that God is getting across by my spirit. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for the great privilege to be in your house this morning. And thank you for all these good folks who came out. And um, by faith, they're here not to hear from me. They're here to hear from you. They're here to receive a blessing from you. They're here to receive what you would give to them. Lord, I'm just asking that you just use me in a special way. That you would allow me to be dead to myself. Fill me with your spirit. I recognize that only you can get your own work accomplished. And so I just set myself as a vessel, as an instrument, that you just get your work accomplished through your precious word, that you would make it clear to us and that you would draw us close and realize how much we need to be dependent upon you. I need you now. Thank you for being God. And you just get your own work through, accomplished through your precious word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Throughout the book of Zechariah, Zechariah has received visions and he has an angel guide who guides him from one vision to another. And he allows Zechariah to ask questions. Sometimes the angel will prop questions. Sometimes Zechariah will ask the questions, but they'll look at one vision after another. And Zechariah says, what is this? And the angel will explain it. Sometimes the angel says, you know what this is? I have no clue. Well, let me tell you what this is. And so they're going through each of these visions with not just leaving it ambiguous, but the angel actually takes time to explain explain what all these are so that way they're applied god doesn't want us just to have these different things and say i have no clue what they are but god wants to help us and to apply them to our own lives notice with me in zechariah chapter number four and the first thing i'd like to show you is the golden candlestick the golden candlestick notice with me in verse number one And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that waketh out of his sleep. So he just finished watching the vision, which we had covered on Wednesday, about the trial of Joshua. And so he watched as Joshua, the high priest, is standing in the courtroom scene with Satan as the prosecutor that... Uh, Joshua is the defendant. You have Jesus as the great advocate standing before the Lord. And we watched as um, the best Joshua could do was his filthy garments. But because of what God had done, that they took the filthy garments on, they put in the white uh, uh, cloak of righteousness and then put on a mitre on his head, which says that he is able to serve God. And they're watching as this high priest, Joshua, the high priest, uh, that God is saying, I've forgiven him. There's nothing he can do, but I've enabled him. I've saved him. I've washed him clean. Now, from that vision, he's waking up and now he's brought to a different vision. Notice this vision, if you don't mind, in verse two and said unto me, what seest thou? And I said, I have looked and behold, a candlestick, all of gold and a bowl on top of it and seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. So he has another vision and the angel says, all right, tell me what you see. He says, what I see is a golden candlestick. So what he sees is a a menorah, a special candlestick with seven branches to it. 
And this candlestick is a huge candlestick that runs off of oil. On top of the candlestick, there is a bowl that is filled with oil. And what has happened is that they have fashioned pipes that go from the bowl to each one of the candlesticks. So that way it's continually lit up with flame. It basically has enough oil to continue to stay lit continually. Next to it, you have a um, verse number three. And two olive trees stood by it, one on the right side of the bowl and the other on the left side of the bowl. So imagine in your mind a candlestick, a candlestick that has seven branches. So and the flames are lighting the whole room because of the light of it. On top of it, you have a bowl. In this bowl is full of oil. This bowl also has pipes that go from the bowl to each one of the seven candlesticks. Then on either side of this, you have two olive trees. We understand that in the ancient world, most of the oil they got to light their lamps came from the olive trees, which grow over there. That when the olive Greek Uh, olive trees are pressed out um, and and, uh, processed that they actually produce an olive oil and this oil is what they use to light their lamps so what happens is that you have the tree on either side that have branches that go over and what's happening is that the oil from the olives that it has goes into the bowl then the bowl goes into the candlesticks the candlesticks continually light the um Uh, are lit and basically it's a picture of the oil continues to flow that it doesn't burn out that the candlesticks are burning and they're continually supplied by oil so you got the picture in your head we have the picture of the golden candlestick with the two olive trees on either side so this is a pretty uh complex uh thing here you have an Uh, a candle that doesn't run out of gas basically it's continually being fed with oil so it can continually be lit and continually do what it was designed to do so notice now as we hit the golden candlestick we've seen this picture here notice if you don't mind the interpretation of it what is this we see the oil of god's spirit The oil of God's spirit. Notice with me in verse 4. So I answered and spake unto the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Now again, Zechariah asked obvious questions um, that you would ask too. What is this? I don't know what this is. I see a candlestick. I see a bowl. I see things going up there. What is this? Notice with me in verse 5. Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. So as he's given this picture, we understand in the Bible, there are certain things that are pictures for other things. So in the Bible, whenever you see the idea of oil, for the most part, it is a picture of God's Holy Spirit. That's just something you just understand and mark down that anytime that you see the idea of oil, it is usually a picture of God's Holy Spirit. So Look back and think about this candle. This candle is continually is created to burn. But a candle by itself will eventually run out of fuel unless it's continually fed. What is it fed by? It is fed by the oil. Now you take this picture and you interpret it, of course, as God interpreted, that how is Zerubbabel supposed to get it done? Is he supposed to get it done by his might? By showing how powerful he is. Come on, let's get it done. Is he supposed to do it by his strength? No, not by his strength either. Not by his might, not by his power. But how is he supposed to do the work that God has given him to do? By my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. You understand, dear friend, that we cannot do God's work. We can't do God's work. Only God can do his work. We can be the vessels that God uses, the instruments God's use to get his work done. So as God gets his work done, he does it through us. And as we continually rely and depend upon God, he'll get his power done. He'll get his work done. Let's back up and let's clearly explain that the first thing that needs to be settled if we're going to be run off God's power is that first of all, we have to understand that we need a savior. 
you understand that no one could be be depended upon the Lord unless they first depend on God by faith for the first thing, and that's salvation. You understand that heaven is a perfect place. That's why we want to go there. And heaven, there's no more sickness, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death, no more tears. It's perfect. That's why we want to go there. But what really makes heaven worth going there is that God is there. And that everything that we know about God, according to the Bible, is that he could be described like this. That he is perfect, perfect, perfect. We would say that he is holy, holy, holy. That word holy carries the idea of perfect. So God is a perfect God. Unfortunately... We're not perfect people, are we? You know, I'm a preacher, but I've disobeyed my folks. How many of you ever disobeyed your folks? Raise your hand. And so, you know what? We admit that we've done something wrong. You know, I'm a preacher, and you may have to gasp, but I've told a lie before. How many of you have ever told a lie before, right? If you're not raising your hand now, you're a liar, right? We've all sinned. The Bible talks about that. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The idea of sinning meaning, means that we broke God's law. I gave you before two of God's Ten Commandments. The Bible says, thou shalt not bear false witness, or we would say, don't tell lies. That's one of God's Ten Commandments. Because we broke that law, we have sin. The Bible says to honor thy father and thy mother. Because we broke that law, we have sinned. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible goes on to explain that in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. Now, what's a wage? A wage is something we earn. For example, when we go to work, we work and we receive money. That's our reward. That is our, re- our wage. The Bible says for the wages of sin, remember sin is breaking God's law, for the wages of sin is death. That word death literally carries the idea of separation. For example, if we were to have a funeral here, we would have a casket and we would have a body inside. And we would say that person is dead. Why? Because their body is there, but their soul is separated out. Who they are is separated out. We call that death. Well, the Bible says for the wages of sin is death. Now, just using logic, you can't set something that's not perfect and place it in a perfect place. It would ruin it. For example, it's raining outside. That means there's plenty of mud. What would happen if my kids decided to go play in the mud and took their muddy clothes and put it on a clean pile of clothes my wife just got through washing? Does that mean that, oh, you know, I'll just take the muddy clothes off and everything else is fine? No, it dirties the whole thing by association. She has to wash everything again. And the same thing's true about heaven. God can't allow anything that's not perfect to go into that perfect place because it would ruin it. So because of that, we deserve to be separated from God and from heaven. For the wages of sin is death. Now when we die, unfortunately, the Bible says there's only two places to go. A wonderful place called heaven or an awful place called hell. Do you know that God never created hell for a single person to go there? He created hell to punish Satan and his demons. Man, however, goes there by default because we deserve to be separated from a holy God. Now, all I've told you right now is bad news. Let me tell you what the good news is. The good news is that God finished off the verse in Romans 6, 23, where he says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, God didn't want to see a single person go to that awful place called hell. So what he did is he robed himself in flesh and came on this earth and dwelt among us as Jesus Christ. And Jesus lived the same life that you and I lived, went through the same temptations, the same troubles and the same heartbreaks. Then Jesus died to pay the price that you and I owed God. And what's more is he did it for free. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, the Bible clearly says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. When we come to the idea of heaven, we recognize that we don't deserve to go to heaven because we're sinners. But Jesus loved us so much, he didn't want us to go to that awful place called hell, that he died on our behalf. And died on the cross to save us. And then he rose again the third day to prove that God was satisfied with the payment that was made. Then all that is left is for us to willingly accept Jesus Christ to be our personal savior. The moment that you accept Jesus Christ as your savior. The Holy Spirit who is God comes to live inside of your heart. 
And let me tell you something. You get all the Holy Spirit you're going to get at that moment. You don't get more or less of the Holy Spirit. However, he doesn't get more. He doesn't necessarily have all of you. That as a Christian, when we come to the place of doing God's work, we recognize that I can't do it in my own strength. I cannot do it. I don't have the power. I don't have the might. You, we realize quite quickly, I can't make people do anything. I can't make you come to church. I can invite you to come to church, but I can't make you come to church. I cannot save anybody. Nobody saves anybody. Jesus does the saving. All I can do is I give people information and then make their own decision, but I can't convince them. I don't have good enough words. I don't have enough eloquent speech to convince them. I wish it did. I wish I could speak to people and all of a sudden they go, Woohoo! Yeah, that's it. I changed my whole life because of what you said. But I recognize that God can do that. Only God can change hearts. Only God can draw people near. Only God can do things. I can be an instrument, but I cannot do it myself. Only God does his work. So what can happen is that I can die to myself and say, God, it's not me. It's you. I surrender myself and you fill me. You be in control and you get your own work accomplished. This is the picture that we see with the candlestick is that we see the candle that is supposed to be burning. That is its job, but it can only burn as it has fuel. It can only do what it's supposed to do as long as it has the fuel. The fuel is the oil that continues to run through it. How does a Christian keep going? Not by my might, not by my strength, but by God's spirit continuing to empower. God's spirit continuing to flow. God's spirit continuing to go. This is the message uh, he has. He says, Zechariah, I have a message for Zerubbabel. Verse 6 again. Then he, that's the angel, answered and spoke unto me, Zechariah, saying, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. So he says, when you get out of this vision, you go to Zerubbabel and you say, God has a message for you. What is the message, Zerubbabel? Zerubbabel, he says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Whose spirit? The Lord of hosts spirit. He says, Zerubbabel, I'm not expecting you to get this work done. I'm expecting me to get this work done. And you are the vessel that the oil runs through. And that I will get my own work done as long as you allow me to do the work through you. This is the picture here that he says to be filled with the spirit. By the way, the Bible says the same thing in the New Testament. This isn't just an Old Testament thing. Ephesians 5, 8. Be not drunk with wine, whereas in excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what God says. We're supposed to be filled. Does that mean that um, that we just kind of add God to it? Being filled with the Spirit, remember, is not so much about putting things into it as it is taking things out. For example, if I have a glass that has um, <clears throat> a little bit of milk in it, halfway is filled with milk. If I want to fill it with Mountain Dew, I just don't add Mountain Dew to it. What would happen is I would get milk dew or something. In order to fill it with Mountain Dew, I first must empty it. Of the contents that's already in there. So it can be filled with that new substance. That's what it means to be filled with a spirit. Is that I die to myself. My ambitions. My goal. From me doing it. And then I allow God to fill me. And let him do the work. He is the empowering thing. He is the one that works. Here's another illustration. Let's say that we had a glove. It's getting to be cold season. So everyone's looking for gloves. Or buying gloves. Or making sure you know where they're at. Getting ready. And so take a glove. If I have a glove and I lay it in the table and say, go ahead and get this work done. Jump, do something. It can't do it. It's incapable of doing it on its own. But if the glove is filled with a power more than itself, my hand, now the glove can be empowered to do a work. It's it's a cheaper illustration, but it gives us the idea. I can't do anything. But God fills me and he can do his work. I'm just surrendered to whatever he'd have me to do. And so God is reminding Zerubbabel that Zerubbabel, you look at this and you look at the work and you look at the people. Why aren't you doing the work? Well, because the adversaries. I'm not doing the work because nobody wants to do the work. I can't do it. I'm just so limited. And God says, all right, guess what, Zerubbabel? You're going to finish this up. Notice as he goes on and talks to this, verse 7. 
Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, thou shall be a plain. By the way, Jesus reiterates this promise where he says, If thou have faith, thou can move mountains. Remember, we can't do it ourselves, but God can. That if I have faith, I have faith in what? The mountain? No, I have faith in God. That God can do its own work. Here it's giving the same idea. He's giving him that same promise that Jesus gives us. That who art thou, O great mountain? So if there's an obstacle in Zerubbabel's weight, just wait. Before Zerubbabel, thou shall be a plain. Move that mountain out of the way. That obstacle, it's gone. It says, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shouting, crying, grace, Grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. All right, so that was 15 years ago. Notice the promise here. His hands, Zerubbabel's hands, shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts have sent me unto you. By the way, this angel here is giving several different promises through the visions. Remember, some of these promises are in the future. That one day, God is going to bring back all the scattered people. We've already covered that. One day, God is going to use Jerusalem to be the capital of the Millennium Kingdom. Now, that's far in the future. You know what the angel is doing here? He's saying, you want proof that God is going to do this stuff in the future? You want proof that God is going to do all those stuff? He says, here's the proof that Zerubbabel started the temple. And he's going to finish it. And when he finishes it, you know that God is going to keep his word. And he's going to do all the rest of it as well. So here's the evidence. That when the temple is finished and it's Zerubbabel that's doing it. That God is proving himself that the Bible is true. And the rest of this prophecy is also fulfilled. It says, (coughs) notice this. Uh, Verse 9 again. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and see the pulmon in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. And there are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. So here again we have a promise. That who shall despise the day of small, um, <coughs> small things? I want you to think back about what's happening. We've already explained that it looks like a war zone. Think of France after World War II with the buildings collapsed. Everything kind of just in ruins. You could just imagine they're trying to clear off a spot and they're rebuilding the temple. And after the discouragement and seeing all the ruins, the people said, ah, it's not worth it right now. And so here's a city that has no walls, a city that's in ruins, a city that they're trying to rebuild. And that is a lot of work, especially since it's not going to look as good as it used to do. And so that's a lot of discouragement. Why should I even try? I mean, I can't get this done. And so a lot of people are discouraged. And he says, wait, wait, who's that person that's going to despise the day of small beginnings? You know what God is going to do is he's going to make Jerusalem one of the most important cities of all the world. God is going to do something, but it starts by step, by step, by step, by step. Someone may say, well, this is just a small church. It's not going to do that much. Never despise the day of small beginnings. God can do something. God's got a plan. And we just trust him and step by step by step. And we'd be amazed to see what God has done. Look at what God has done. Notice as it goes on, verse 10. Who would despise the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and see the pulment of the hand of Zerubbabel. And then it talks about the eyes of the Lord. This is again trying to picture God's omnipresence and omniscience. That God is all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's everywhere at once. That God knows everything. He's able to see and clearly know what's going to happen. You may see something small, but God sees the end of it. And he sees what's going to happen and what's going to be accomplished because of it. So what we see, first of all, is we took a a glance at the golden candlestick. Then we see the oil of God's spirit, that this is all a picture. This was just a visual picture to say, you need the gas that runs the machine is God, God's spirit. He's the one that runs the machine. By the way, we apply that to ourselves. We need to trust in God. Let God do his own work. You want to beat your, your head against the wall? Keep doing it by yourself. Keep doing it by your own strength. Keep saying, I can make this person listen. I can make him change. I'm going to convince him. You keep beating your head against the wall enough and then finally surrender and say, you know what? I'm going to let God take care of it. And all of a sudden, everything changes. Why? Because God can do his work a lot better than we can. 
Can we trust God to do his own work? Then we come to the last portion here in verse 11. And we see here the two witnesses. The two witnesses. Then answered I and said unto them, What are the two olive trees upon the right hand of the candlestick and upon the right side thereof? So here's the next question. So Zerubbabel said, or, um, Zechariah says, All right, you've explained the candlestick and you explained the bowl and the oil keep going. Now, what are these two trees on the other side? What, what are they? I, I want to know what this is. Verse 12, And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes carry the golden, uh, the golden oil out of themselves. And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These be the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. So what he does is he sees these two olive trees. And these olive trees, again, have the branches that... that go over into this cup, this bowl of the candlestick, and they're continually feeding oil into it. And he says, what are these? And he says, these are pictures of the two witnesses, the two um, representatives that I have, the two anointed ones. When you take that word literally, the anointed ones, these are the sons of oil. These are the chosen ones that I have that are anointed by my spirit. They are going to Do the work of God in the power and guidance of God's Holy Spirit. Now, remember that many prophecies have a more um, literal fulfillment that's early. And then they have a more complete fulfillment later on in the future. This is one of those passages. The more immediate fulfillment is that God is taking time in the previous chapter to talk about Joshua, the high priest. And in this chapter, talk about Zerubbabel. He's saying, these are my two anointed ones. And through them, by my spirit, I'm going to get work done. By the leadership, by Zerubbabel, who is the the political leader, the governor of those people. And then Joshua, who's the spiritual leader. He's the high priest. By these two leaders, they are going to guide the work that I have for Jerusalem. Rebuilding the temple and then rebuilding the walls. uh, Rebuilding Jerusalem. These two are going to be the one that I guide to it. Again, what is the purpose of the book of Zechariah? To encourage the people to rise up and build. And by this vision, God is saying, these are the two men that I appoint as leaders. And by these two men, as you follow them, as they follow Christ, the work is going to get accomplished, rebuilding the temple and then rebuilding the walls. Now, that's the encouragement for the people of that time. We know also that the more complete fulfillment is going to happen in the book of Revelation in the future. And that's something we get to look forward to. In fact, we're going to spend time tonight. I'm not going to talk about that this morning. Come back tonight and see the more fulfilled um, scriptures, how they're fulfilled of God's two witnesses. And we're going to see how important they are in the book of Revelation as they preach for three and a half years and what happens to them and the important events that surround them, these two witnesses that God uses in our future. Now, for the application, what do we do about this? We know that for the children of Israel at this time, the application they were supposed to make is that they were supposed to follow Zerubbabel, follow uh, Joshua, and through the leadership, they were supposed to rise up and build and continue to build the temple under God's power, not their own. Let God get accomplished his own work. What about for us? Well, we can also apply the idea that we can't do God's work. The sooner that you realize this principle, the better off you're going to be. You know, sometimes people aren't taught this principle and they spend their Christian life feel like they're beating their head against a wall. They're trying so hard. They're trying to get it done. And the more that they try, the more that it just doesn't work. The more that, you know, I try to, I'm so, I want this person saved. And I talk to them and I beat my head and I'm so frustrated and they argue with me and just, ah, Well, it's because you've been trying to do it. You've been trying to convince them in their own way. Many preachers in the ministry end up having this same thing. That they try to pastor a church in their own strength. And they try to do it and the burden goes and it bears them down and they get ruined. And they get to the place where I just can't do it anymore. Well, you're not supposed to do it in the first place. Only God can do his work. That as I surrender myself and say, God, you do your own work. Man, it's amazing to see what God will do and what God does to change lives. I don't have to do it myself. You know how freeing that is? 
Sunday school teachers, same thing. How many Sunday school teachers get weighted down and they teach year after year and just sometimes the results don't seem to be there and and they're trying hard and they come up with this and they're doing the best they can. And when they finally learn, you know what? I'm just going to let God teach this class. I'm just going to be there. And all of a sudden people are getting saved and children are getting called to the ministry and they're excited and they're reading their Bible on their own and they go, what happened? I just finally let God do his own work. Josh, come here. Please. In the book of James, it explains this principle like this. Come up here if you don't mind. It says, God resisteth the proud. So stand over here if you don't mind. This is my strong arm. All right. So let's say that he, with his own strength, pushes against me. You're trying to go this way. And what happens is he's doing it by himself. Come on, man. All right. As he's doing it, what's happening is that I have to push more force to resist him. He's not going anywhere. Isn't he getting a lot of energy out? But he's not getting anything accomplished. The Bible says, God resisteth the proud. What is pride? It's doing it ourselves. It's trying to say, I could do this. I can get it done. I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to make them listen. I've got it. The Bible says that God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. So instead of pushing against them, when we say, God, you just go ahead and get it done. What happens is that God says, all right, let's go. And all of a sudden, it, without any force, without anything, things get accomplished. Why? Because it's not him doing it. It's God. Thank you. And so that sometimes we, we wonder, how come things aren't changing? How come things aren't working? I'm just... Ugh. Because we're trying to still do it. We're trying to change people. We're trying to fix things. We're trying to make things work. And it is amazing to see the difference when we finally step back and say, God, you're in charge now. I'm going to let you take care of this. You just tell me what to do. And all of a sudden, lives change. You say, I've been working on it for 20 years. And he wouldn't do anything. And I've spoke to him. And I've yelled at him. And I've loved on it. I've done everything I could. It just didn't work. And all of a sudden, I just take my hands off and say, all right, God, fine. You take care of him. And all of a sudden, just like that, they change. Some, I've seen that time and time again. Sometimes it's not that instant. But it's amazing how many times it is. Just because God said, I was just waiting for you to finally say, you take it. I'm just trying to wait to the time where you've stopped doing it yourself. Isn't that an amazing pr- truth? Isn't that an amazing principle? The Christian life is not meant to be a weight it down, burdensome thing. It's meant to be a freedom thing because we cast all of our cares on Jesus and saying, God, you take care of this. Whether it's an obstacle in your way, a mountain, God can move it and set that obstacle out of the way. Whether it's a burden that you have for someone to get saved, that God can take care of them. Whether it's a family member that's breaking your heart. And you say how are they ever going to come to the Lord? How are they ever going to get right? How are they ever going to change? Let God do it. Take my hands off. Not by might. Nor by power. But by my spirit. saith the Lord of hosts. Can you trust God. To, that he can do his own work. That's what it comes down to. Is it you that's getting it done? Is it you that's struggling? Is it you that feels like it has to be you? Or can you trust God that he can get his own work accomplished? It comes to the idea, who do you trust? There's a lot of times that we just have a hard time letting go because we think we have to do it. Maybe some of you have got a burden on your heart today. Maybe it's a health thing that this health obstacle has been in your way and it's been keeping you. You understand that God can give grace to the humble and say, God, you just give me grace for this infirmity that I have and you use me. It's amazing to see what God can do. Maybe some of you have a financial burden. Say, God, I just don't have enough money. I don't know how it's going to happen. And I've been working just as long as you feel like it's you that has to do it. And say, God, I give you my finances. You take care of this. It's amazing to see what God can do. When you say, I'll just be obedient, you tell me what to do. Maybe there's a family member that has been breaking your heart. And they've made one bad decision after another, after another, after another. Maybe it's time for you just to take your hands off and step away. And stay stepping away. That's the hardest thing to do is not to keep reaching back and taking it and say, just to say, God, you take care of them. You tell me what to do, but I trust you. To work in that person's life. It seems impossible. And left up to them it is impossible. But with you God all things are possible. I can trust you. I can trust you. 
Maybe there's someone that you love very much that doesn't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And you've wrote them letters. You've prayed for them. You've convinced. uh, You've tried to talk with them. And it's come nowhere. It's like talking to a wall. Maybe it's time for you to say, Lord, you save them. You convince them. You show them that you're real. And you, God, you do whatever it takes. You know, sometimes we're just afraid to say that. God, you do whatever it takes to bring that person to Christ. Sometimes it does mean the most horrible things that could happen to them can turn to the greatest things that ever happened to them if they get closer with the Lord. If, can you trust God? Can you let God be God in your life and let him do his own work? Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 920- Five three zero six three zero eight. Once again, that number is nine two zero five three zero six three zero eight. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.